across Australia. This is the latest from 7 News with Melissa Doyle and Matt Doran. Good evening and welcome. For many, it is a day for faith and reflection. And today, across the world, there's certainly a lot to think about. And right now, there's a lot of time to do just that. Despite doctors saying we're on the cusp of defeating the pandemic, it's more important than ever to stay at home. But tonight, the six-month timeline is under scrutiny. Experts suggesting tough restrictions are only needed for six weeks. Recovered and relieved, we're joined by a former Queensland police officer home from hospital after COVID-19 nearly claimed her life. Bagging a bargain, has the pandemic created a perfect storm for first home buyers? And celebrating our healthcare workers, the great lengths communities are going to to thank their hospital heroes. But first, it is the question we are all asking. How long will these restrictions last? The Prime Minister says six months at least. But some experts believe a shorter, sharper lockdown will be much more effective. From today, Australia should look at a much sharper lockdown, more comprehensive than we have at the moment, uh, in the hope that if we do that, we can shorten the time that we would be under those conditions. Health policy expert Bill Botel doesn't have an easy message to sell. Tougher restrictions to shorten the lockdown. Every day that we don't do the maximum, we can add a week onto the other end. Uh, That's the way the epidemiology works. So being tough now pays off uh, down the track. And that means shutting down virtually all movement and industry across the country. We have to look at the situation on building sites. Tradies on those sites are working more or less as normal. Uh, The physical distancing is obviously very difficult to ensure on a building site. They're released, I guess, under the term of essential services, but the virus doesn't get that memo. The good news, it wouldn't have to take six months. I don't think that's the case at all. A lockdown could probably be as short as four weeks. Not everyone agrees. The time to start ending this lockdown is now. There's growing pressure on the government to ease off the tough restrictions. Our response to the coronavirus outbreak has decimated our society, ruined thousands of lives, turned Australia into a police state, and worst of all, put hundreds of thousands of Australians out of work. This is on those people to uh, use facts and evidence and science and to say what supports them in their assumption that if we ease off now, we may not engender a second wave of viral transmission. These decisions will place the most significant restrictions on New Zealanders' movements in modern history. In New Zealand, a harsh level four lockdown has resulted in just two deaths so far. Are we doing all that we can to increase physical distance to make sure the surfaces are sanitised and and sustainably so? No, I don't think we are. Certainly not compared to, uh, say, New Zealand and other countries who have moved very swiftly to uh, ensure that the lockdown is as tight as possible. Tonight, a New South Wales MP who breached the current restrictions has finally faced the music. After being fined yesterday for visiting his holiday home, the state's arts minister, Don Harwin, has resigned. New South Wales political reporter Alex Hart has the latest. And Alex, how did this unfold? Well, Mel, Don Harwin came under enormous pressure to take this course of action today. Once he was fined by police last night for breaching coronavirus public health orders, that in reality and politically his position became untenable. He was fined for staying at his holiday home on the central coast for about a month instead of staying at his primary residence here in Sydney. This was revealed yesterday, just before 6pm tonight. He released a statement which says, in part, I will not allow my circumstances to be a distraction from that work, referring to the government's efforts to tackle the coronavirus crisis. And I very much regret that my residential arrangements have become an issue during this time. Make no mistake, the Premier here, Gladys Berejiklian, forced this decision and she released a statement of her own shortly after we received confirmation from Don Harwin that he was stepping down. It says in part, whilst Minister Harwin has served the people of New South Wales well and he continues to assure me that he did not break the rules, the orders in place apply equally to everybody. Accordingly, Minister Harwin has appropriately resigned from Cabinet. A tough day for Gladys Berejiklian personally, losing a close political ally and friend from Cabinet.
but it would seem she had no choice politically once a minister was found to have breached rules that have been put in place to save lives. As I said before, his position became untenable. Mel. All right, Alex Hart, thanks very much. For more on police operations in New South Wales, Serena Andaloro joins us. Serena, have people listened to official warnings today? They sure have, Mel, today. They confirmed 50 people have been slapped with $1,000 fines in an Easter long weekend bliss. They say it's a stern warning to all those still out and about and especially in their cars this Easter long weekend. You will be issued with a ticket. Now, New South Wales has seen three new deaths overnight and 49 new cases. That's our first daily increase in more than a week, Mel. And extra precautions were taken at Sydney's famous fish market today. Well, Mel, police directed a steady flow of cars around Sydney's famous fish markets, making sure everyone was adhering to social distancing rules. Quite extraordinary measures, considering this is usually one of the busiest spots in the country on Good Friday. But temperatures were checked as shoppers filed in one by one. The total number of shoppers allowed inside was strictly limited. They were trying to avoid that crowd crush the fish markets are so famous for, and it worked. It was much quieter, Mel. All right. Serena and Aloro, thank you. Let's go now to reporter Tegan Dolling live in Melbourne. Tegan, good evening. Victorian police have also begun clamping down there. Yeah, they really have, and it seems as though some Victorians are a little bit upset by what they're saying is heavy-handed policing, but they are definitely using discretion, Victoria Police, and I'll get to that in a minute. Late this afternoon, we saw uh, some protesters take to a hotel in Preston. Now, police were down there very quickly. The protesters were there because uh, they were protesting against some Manus Island refugees that were uh, inside the hotel, and obviously, Victoria Police saying this is not essential to be happy at the moment. 26 fines, $1,600 fines were handed out there and also one man was arrested. Something else Victoria Police is looking at over these next four days, being such a crucial part of this self-isolation, is a lot of our holiday areas down the Mornington Peninsula and the Great Ocean Road. Our cameras went there this afternoon just to see if people were sticking to the rules and making sure that they were staying at home. And it seems as though that was the case because they were practically isolated. These towns that are thriving usually over this time of the year, they were deserted. So thankfully, people, it seems as though Melburnians, are staying home and not heading down to their holiday houses. Now, just quickly, I do want to give you just a couple more figures. 98 fines have been handed out uh, across Victoria over the last 24 hours and 754 spot checks have been carried out. So there's spot checks on homes, businesses and those people doing non-essential services. Just to let you know... There were 11 youths that had a house party here in Melbourne last night. As you can imagine, Victoria Police very quickly on scene shut the party down. 11 people there were slammed with having a $1,600 fine. And as I was talking about discretion a little bit earlier, uh, police have also found, uh, given a fine to a man who has had four warnings. So four times he has been told, do not leave your house, you have nowhere else to be. But again, he was found out today wandering around, Matt, and he he too was handed a $1,600 fine. As he should have been. It's a clear message. Stay home. Thanks very much to Tegan Dolling there. Dozens of Australians have just touched down on home soil with Virgin's first repatriation flight touching down in Brisbane in the last few hours. Reporter Elliot Chipper was there for the arrival. And Elliot, how many people were on board? Good evening, Mel. Yes, there were 50 Australians on this first Mercy flight to come to Australia from the US. Also on board was 13 tonnes of medical and mining equipment. Now, passengers did have to pay for this flight themselves. It worked out to be approximately $700 Australian, but that didn't buy you much. They could only have economy seats, food and beverage service was limited throughout the flight, and there was no in-flight entertainment. And as anybody knows, on these long-haul flights the other side of the world, world that makes for a very long plane ride. These passengers have landed. They're going through customs now. They'll then be greeted by Australian Defence Force and police as well. They'll be escorted onto the bus where they'll then be taken for 14 days isolated quarantine in hotels that are here at the airport. Mel? All right, but they're happy to be home though. When is the next uh, repatriation flight arriving? 
Yes, it was Virgin today. It'll be Qantas tomorrow. Both airlines are operating one flight one way each week for the next three weeks. So not that many flights for Aussies still stuck over in the US to go to get home. There are flights that are flying in from Hong Kong as well. One of those left Brisbane this morning carrying Australian supplies of meat, seafood, Australian produce. That'll be returning back to Brisbane tomorrow night with essential medical supplies for our frontline staff. Staff. Those flights will be flying twice a week, but only for a limited number of weeks as well. Mel? All right, Elliot. Chipper, thank you very much. Well, from today, people in New South Wales caught spitting or coughing on frontline workers will be hit with a $5,000 on-the-spot fine and could even face six months in jail. The harsh new penalty follows a disturbing trend of abuse towards medical staff and police officers. More crew members on board the Ruby Princess have tested positive to COVID-19. 88 staff who were showing symptoms of the virus were swabbed and around 36 tested positive. The troubled cruise ship is currently docked at Port Kembla. The plan is to keep the crew on board for now where they are effectively in isolation. The 14-day isolation period has ended for passengers in quarantine on a cruise ship docked off the WA coast. Reporter Brittany Hoskins joins us live from Perth. And Brittany, what has happened to those passengers on board? Mel, for those West Aussies quarantined on Rottnest Island tonight, their home. Around 200 people arrived here by ferry a little over an hour ago. They were extremely excited to see family and friends as they came into shore. For those Eastern States passengers, however, their situation is a little more complicated. They can go home, but there are no flights to get them there. State government says it will continue to look after those people with accommodation and food as it tries to organise flights out of WA. And also, police have been threatening to close Perth beaches, Brittany. That's right, and despite the warning, hundreds of people packed popular beaches today. It was no surprise with temperatures ranging between the mid to high 30s. For the most part, people did do the right thing. They kept their distance or stayed for a short period of time by themselves with family or with one other person. Of course, there was a strong police presence. Officers patrolled on foot. The police helicopter and a water police also patrolled our coast, but no fines or move on notices were issued. Now, with another hot day forecast for tomorrow, the beaches are remaining open, but authorities have warned that could change if people don't adhere to social distancing rules. Mel. All right, Brittany Hoskins, thank you. Moving overseas now, and the dire situation in America is showing no sign of improving. US correspondent Paul Kadak is live for us in New York City. Uh, Paul, some extraordinarily confronting images today, coffins being buried there in a mass grave. Good evening, Matt. Yeah, very much a grim sign of the times. Here in New York on a, on a typical day, around 150 people pass away, but now we are seeing close to 800 people dying every day just from coronavirus. It has meant that the city's morgues are full or filling up fast. Makeshift morgues, which we're now seeing uh, uh, put up outside hospitals, are filling up fast as well. So they've had to well, change the rules to deal with that situation. The city says it will only keep uh, bodies unclaimed for two weeks before they move to temporary burial and to make room in the morgues for COVID-19 victims. They've had to uh, move bodies to a place that has been New York's graveyard of last resort since the Civil War. It's called Hart Island in Long Island Sound, just off the Bronx. Uh, since that time, around a million New Yorkers are buried there, victims of the Spanish flu epidemic of a century ago, of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s and now uh, people are having to be buried there in large excavated trenches because of the coronavirus outbreak. The bodies are, the, the caskets are marked. There is the option for those bodies to be reclaimed uh, even once they are buried but it certainly is, as I say, a grim sign of the times. Uh, the Governor of New York State has spent weeks calling for medical personnel to come to New York from around the country to help them deal with the outbreak 
break. Now the call is going out to funeral directors around the country to help this city and this state deal with its latest crisis. Matt. Unbelievably uh, distressing, those images. Horror unemployment today. Uh, levels out today with one in ten Americans losing their jobs. That is just in the last three weeks. I shiver to ask this, uh, Paul, but can it get much worse? Well, that is the that is the question. But the, the bottom line is this: never in U.S. history have so many people lost their jobs so suddenly. Those latest figures we saw just for last week: 6.6 million Americans filing for unemployment claims. That came on top of 10 million uh, Americans from the previous two weeks. So, as you say, almost 17 million people in three weeks losing their jobs. That means that small business ha has run out of money to keep those people on staff. That means even larger businesses have been furloughing. Uh, have been furloughing workers, putting those workers off. Now, in the last couple of weeks, the US government has put into place a, a multi-trillion dollar plan to try and help struggling industries to uh, uh, give small businesses loans. But even with those programs in place, what we're hearing is that businesses are struggling to get those loans. There are so many people asking for financial help that it, the system is just clogging up. So there have been calls for more financial assistance from the US government, more rescue packages mm -hmm. to come uh, because they fear it could get worse with predictions of unemployment reaching 20 to 30 per cent. Hard to even comprehend. Uh, it's a bleak forecast. Let's hope the infection numbers come down and they come down quickly. Paul Caddack from New York. Thank you. Well, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is out of intensive care tonight and reportedly in good spirits. So let's bring in Europe correspondent Sarah Green Alsh. Sarah, Boris Johnson remains under observation though. How's he doing? No, good evening. We are told that Boris Johnson is in the early phase of his recovery. So he is being closely monitored by doctors, as you say, but he spent the first night on a ward last night after those three in intensive care. And the announcement late yesterday that he was well enough to be moved out of ICU coincided with the third week of uh, the clap for carers, this nationwide round of applause here in the UK for the doctors and nurses of the NHS. And as you can imagine, there was a uh, especially loud uh, cheering and round of applause from all the unit blocks around across the road from St Thomas's. Even though he's said to be recovering, Boris Johnson is unlikely to be leading the country anytime soon. And the government has some really big decisions that need to be made, like when the current lockdown will be lifted, although it is looking increasingly like that will be a fair way off. The UK's death toll is now uh, almost at 8,000. And for the past few days, the daily death tolls have been uh, over 800. There are also some serious concerns about how the weather this weekend will affect things. It's pretty glorious by UK standards. It's supposed to be 24 degrees and sunny here today. So they are extremely worried authorities about people going outside. The message remains for everyone to stay at home. Sarah, can you tell me about Sweden? Because they've taken quite a liberal approach to the coronavirus measures and it now appears to be backfiring. Mel, Sweden has been a real outlier. So there's basically never been a lockdown. Restaurants, primary schools, everything unlike the rest of Europe still remains open. And medical experts have really been fearing that the weaker measures would eventually lead to a more severe outbreak. That seems to be happening with the number of cases now skyrocketing. So the case fatality ratio in Sweden is 8%. In neighbouring countries like Norway and Denmark, it is 2 and 4% respectively. Uh, the chief medical officer who has been advising the government in Sweden has been advocating this herd immunity approach. So that's something they were talking about here in the UK at the very beginning until they realised that it would just be way too much of a burden on the health system. Uh, one doctor in particular, the head of a hospital there, has been quoted as saying that the approach will, quote, probably end in a historical massacre. Almost two and a half thousand doctors, scientists, other experts have now signed an open letter to the government urging them to enforce some stricter measures. No? Oh, God. All right, Sarah, thank you for that update. Just incredible. Oh, those numbers, those images, those New York pictures, it's just overwhelming. Sometimes. It certainly is. As we've seen, this is a virus that is indiscriminate. It doesn't respect political office. It doesn't care about celebrity status either. There's a growing list of high profile victims. And among them is Pink, who today spoke for the first time about her and her son Jamison's frightening battle with COVID-19. This is the pink we know best, on stage in Perth in 2018. 
full of life, unstoppable. But today, a very different side of this superstar. This is the scariest thing I've ever, ever been through in my whole life. Appearing on a US talk show, Pink opened up about her and her son Jamison's battle with COVID-19. The three-year-old came down with symptoms first. It started with a fever for him and it would come and go and then he would have stomach pains and diarrhea and chest pains and then a headache and then um, sore throat. Soon after, Pink fell ill. First a sore throat and then, in the middle of the night, she woke up unable to breathe. You can't help but watch the news every day and I'm like, oh my God, like... Wow, all the crazy stuff I did, like this is it, touch my face, <laughs> like this is the way it ends. Asthma medication helped, and after more than a week, their symptoms began to ease. Pink hopes her experience will convince others to take the virus seriously. Just like when Hollywood star Tom Hanks and his wife, Rita Wilson, tested positive. The revelation Prince Charles had also been infected was another wake-up call to the world. He has now fully recovered. Having uh, recently gone through the process of contracting this coronavirus, luckily with relatively mild symptoms, um, I now find myself on the other side of the illness, but still in uh, no less a state of social uh, distance and, and, and general isolation. Pink also remains in isolation and is urging her millions of fans to do the same. Every single person in the world right now gets to be a superhero just by staying home. That's the message, isn't it, everywhere? I know it's probably really getting harder and harder by the day for a lot of people, but we just got to hang in there. And the superpower is you can save lives. Yeah. That's not bad. Yeah. Still to come, unconscious for three days and on life support. The former Queensland police officer almost killed by COVID-19 joins us tonight. Breakthrough rapid testing rolled out in Australian hospitals, how it works. Why first home buyers could get a bargain. Our finance editor has some handy tips. And celebrity chef Pete Evans under fire for spruiking a bizarre device he claims can help in the fight against coronavirus. That is coming up on the latest from 7 News. Well, every day we are busy here at The Latest analysing the number of people catching COVID-19, but it's also really important to focus on the patients who recover. So tonight, Denham Hitchcock is doing just that. And Denham, a lot of people are talking about this story today. They certainly are, Mel, and for one very good reason. A heartwarming video of a woman by the name of Kim Watkins leaving hospital on the Gold Coast. Take a look at this. <laughs> Oh, that is so good. I love that video. Look, the applause from the doctors and the nurses was because only days earlier, Kim had been unconscious and on a ventilator. She's now back at home with her husband and very much looking forward to dinner and sleeping in her own bed. Kim, can I start by saying that I am delighted to be talking to you. You look remarkably well for someone who's come out of ICU. Thank you very much. Um, I feel remarkably well from someone to come out of ICU. <laughs> it must have been an incredible sight for you to come through those doors. Walk me through that remarkable video with the doctors and nurses, they're cheering you. Oh, honestly, I started clapping them because they are the real heroes. They're the ones who got me that far. Um, I would not have, I doubt whether I've got that far without them. You couldn't see the smile behind my <laughs> mask, but every one of those people I think I had some sort of contact with. For them to be there cheering me was uh, just very emotional, but it was also the best day. They, I owe them every debt. Kim, tell me how all this started. You were on a holiday with your husband in New York, as I understand it. Yeah, um, we went to New York um, as planned on the 11th of March, and by the 15th I'd already started to get um, symptoms so by the 17th, we had decided, no, nah, this is, we got to go home. So when you got home, how fast did you start to go downhill? Actually, quite quickly. And every day I would wake up and just think, I can't get out of bed. My appetite got less and less till I was barely eating anything. And so when I called the nurse that day and she got the doctor in and he just made the decision there and then to get me to ICU, 
and I imagine I think it was probably within within an hour of them making that decision, getting me up there and being in there, I was on the ventilator, mm. which I'm pretty certain saved my life. Do you remember much from that point, from when you had the ventilator? Not, not for those three days. Um, I didn't even know how long I'd been in there. When I was able to ask the nurse how long I was in there, she said three days. And I, wow, I slept through my wedding anniversary, I slept through my son's birthday, I slept through my husband's birthday. So <clears throat> it was, that was scary. So at this point, you're in ICU, you're comatose, your husband, Grant, is at home and you slept through your mm. anniversary. He must have been absolutely worried sick. Well, he couldn't come and see me. He couldn't. He was getting very little information because, as you can understand, they, you know, they can only answer so many questions at one time. Yeah, he was here on his own. He was still, he was still under isolation, so he couldn't even go anywhere himself. That is one of the difficult things with this virus, isn't it? The people that you love the most, you can't be near them. I can't imagine what it would be like for them. I mean, I, if it had, you know, if it had gone the other way, I would have just silently slipped away and I wouldn't have known anything else they're the ones who would have been left behind to deal with not having been able to see me and say goodbye Kim tell me about that moment where you came through the front door to see your husband Grant oh, <laughs> I was so happy to see him I couldn't hug him but I was so happy to see him just to see his beautiful face and um be going home with him yeah tell me what's the thing that you're most looking forward to now you're at home well like yesterday it was the sleeping in my own bed <laughs> so i've done that <laughs> and i'm very happy about that but i'm home and kim please tell me grant must be on uh, cooking duties the husband is on cooking duties surely oh absolutely <laughs> yep yep we had pizza last night but yeah tonight tonight he's cooking yes <laughs> Uh, Kim, our doctors and nurses, they really are on the front line of this war, aren't they? They are, and they, they leave their families every day to go and do what they do. Well, Kim, you've given us all a big lift here today, so uh, I wish the best uh, to you with your recovery. Thanks so much for talking to us today. Thank you very much. All the best. Uh, has to be my favourite interview, I reckon, of these last few weeks. And there's a lot of dark stories on this virus, so this is a good reminder that hundreds of Australians have recovered from coronavirus. And, Matt, what a boost to our healthcare workers to be able to send them home safe and well. It's, uh, it's tr truly unbelievable. That, that is what our healthcare workers yeah. are doing. They are saving lives. That's the difference they're making to Australian families. Grant shouldn't just be on cooking duties. He also owes a wedding anniversary present. <laughs> So he can't get out <laughs> oh, of that. Oh, that's really nice. I'm so glad they're good. Still to come, game changer, the brand new rapid test for critically ill patients. Results within an hour. Fish without a fever, the measures keeping seafood shoppers safe. Could temperature tests become a part of our everyday lives? And why Australia's head doctors are lashing out at celebrity chef Pete Evans. That's next, the latest here at 7 News. In an Australian first, critically ill patients can be tested at the hospital for coronavirus and receive their results within an hour. So let's bring in infectious diseases physician Sanjaya Sananayaka. Sanjaya, thank you for joining us tonight. Just explain this rapid test and more than anything, why it is so significant. Hi, Mel. So this, this rapid test, unlike the antibody rapid test we talked about yesterday, involves a throat and nasopharyngeal swab, and it detects some genetic material from the virus, a, a PCR test. So it's like the current test, but the current test takes about five to six hours to process. And if you take into account transportation and that you might have batches of hundreds of tests, that can be one, two or three days to get a result. Therefore, this can only uh, take uh, 45 minutes if you're really quick, an hour or so. And it is very useful in places with a high burden of disease. So St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney looks after suburbs like Bondi, where there's community transmission. So it's useful in that setting. It also can quickly tell us 
before a patient really gets into the hospital, whether they need to go to a COVID ward or to just a normal respiratory ward. And that has implications for the personal protective equipment that healthcare workers use, which are so precious to us at the moment. And uh, finally, there are COVID patients who won't necessarily be eligible for certain types of oxygen therapy that people without COVID would be. So it will help us at a number of levels. Wow. Sanjay, could I ask you about one of the things that's been troubling me as we, we look to the future here and try and see a way out? We've seen the lockdown lifted in Wuhan. We've seen lo lots of people leaving. In South Korea, around 51 recovered patients have again tested positive. This was in a relatively short time frame. This goes to the fears of a second wave, I guess. Uh, does this mean the virus can remain dormant? So not necessarily, Matt. This seems to be a phenomenon we've seen in China as well, where people have tested negative on discharge from hospital and then they've been followed up in the community and found to be positive again. Now, this could be for a couple of reasons. And one we know with viruses in general, enteroviral infections, CMV, very common infections, that even after you're better, you can still excrete the virus. And the test that we're using, the PCR test, doesn't tell us if the virus is dead or alive. So it could be intermittent shedding of dead virus. But even if it is living virus, the fact that these people aren't getting sick again and that people in their household aren't getting sick suggested that it's in too small a dose to be causing a problem. So I wouldn't worry about that at this stage. All right, we can write that one off. But should we be worried then about any second second waves of outbreaks? Should we here be concerned? So we're still trying to learn how much immunity an infection gives you. The Doherty Institute uh, showed a, a very nice study where a patient was uh, followed during their mild illness and they had a very strong immune response with antibodies suggesting they'd be protected. There have been a, a study in two macaque monkeys who were infected twice with the uh, COVID-19 coronavirus. First time they got sick, the second time they didn't, suggesting that the antibodies are protective. And we know with other coronavirus infections, we get at least some long-term immunity about two to three years. So hopefully that will be the case with this one. Sanjay, uh, on an Easter weekend, uh, not even COVID-19 will stand between Australians and their love of fish. Sydney Fish Market carried out temperature checks on all Good Friday customers today. Is that something you think we can expect to see more of, that that's rolled out, these temperature te checks across Australia? Well, Matt, actually, if you go to a number of hospitals, you will see temperature checks being carried out. The reality, though, is they may not be that useful. If you look at border checks at airports, which involve temperature checks and asking questions from passengers who have uh, disembarked from a plane, you will uh, find, say, with Ebola in 2014, they looked at 300,000 passengers in three countries. There were four exported cases. None of them were detected with border screening. With H1N1 influenza in 2009, only 30% of cases were picked up with border screening. And, and the reason that temperature checking may not be that effective is one, the thermometer may not be that effective. Two, the person may be infected but may not have symptoms yet, so you won't detect a fever. Three, they may be sick, but they may be in between a time period they're having a fever or they've taken paracetamol or uh, neurofen and they don't have a fever at the time that they're checked. So it's far more important that if you are sick with all the public messaging we've had through the government, through the media, that people understand that they shouldn't be going into public places. Yeah. And stay home. <laughs> Sanjaya, you are. Thank you. It's, uh, it's Good Friday. Thank you for joining us tonight. And, um, yeah, all the best to you for the weekend. Thanks Happy so much. Easter. Yeah. Thanks. See yeah. Well, still to come, while the property market may be facing challenges, there are some winners. We reveal who. Behind the $15,000 machine, Chef Pete Evans claims can help fight coronavirus. And when thank you isn't quite enough, how the world shows its appreciation to those frontline heroes. That's next, here at the latest from 7 News.
Well, police have already begun handing out fines across the country for those breaking social distancing restrictions. Among those is one Victorian man who copped a $1,600 penalty for cleaning his car at the local car wash. That's despite being the only customer there. To discuss, let's bring in our panellists, journalist Caroline Overington and commentator Dee Madigan. Uh, good evening to you both. Dee, to you first. The fine has since been withdrawn, but this, uh, to many, is being seen as an example of some of the confusion around these restrictions. Absolutely. So if a guy's driving past and he sees the car wash is open, I would think if it's open, it must mean it's OK to use it. I don't understand you know, there's clothes shops that are open. Are you allowed to try on clothes or not? I do think there's confusion. I think the police were overreacting by fining him. Uh, what, do, what do you think, Caroline? I mean, uh, the, your, I, I tend to agree. If, this, if the car wash is open, it probably is their issue that the police should be looking at. Well, it could be open for a range of reasons. We don't know why. You know it's illegal to drive with your number plate covered with any kind of dirt, so that might be a reason to clean it. The point is that we are told to stay home and we have to follow the rules and not look for loopholes. And one of those loopholes would be, I'm going to wash the car, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. It's the not Prime an essential Minister, service, is it? No, we have been told to stay home. And what's more important is it's working. Staying home is working. We are taking care of the health system. We are taking care of our doctors. We are taking care of our nurses. We are making sure that people don't die. So don't go and wash your car. It's as simple as that. Uh, moving on, Mr Pete Evans is spruiking a $15,000 <laughs> light machine, which he says could help in the fight against coronavirus. Uh, the chef's endorsement has been met with significant criticism from health authorities. Um, listen, I don't know where you sit on this. I like a subtle energy revitalisation program uh, as much as the next man. But uh, d does this thing work? Look, p part of me wants to think that if people are stupid enough to spend money on that, they deserve to lose money. But as someone who works in advertising, if I'm making any health claim in an ad, I have to jump through a million hoops to prove it's a legitimate claim. So I don't understand why those same rules don't apply to selling something on social media. You know, there might be people who genuinely think that because they've got this light machine, they are somehow protected from the virus and God help us. I mean, it's the Gwyneth Paltrow thing. Part of me thinks it's funny, and but there's a bit of me that knows it, it is dangerous. Where do you sit on this, Caroline? I think you should stick to talking to activated almonds. Pete Evans is not a doctor and he is not a scientist. I don't know if he, he talks a, to the almonds. He, is, he, he cooks a, with them. <laughs> he's a chef. So we can take some advice from him when it comes to how to sear a piece of chicken. But when it comes to, 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 to solving the problem of coronavirus, I, I mean, part of me agrees with Dee. Like, if you want to spend $15,000 on what's essentially a lava lamp, knock yourself out. But on the other hand, there are people out there who will believe him. And I think it's really unfair. This is a, it falls into the same camp as the anti-vaxxers who are going around, you know, letterboxing in Bondi, saying that the, the pandemic can be cured by all manner of green juices it's wrong it's false it's also morally wrong you just don't want people falling for it that's the thing the ama has dismissed it as a fancy light machine so i think you're spot on with your criticism of how effective it is i'm um, just moving on the majority of australians are counting down the days uh, until we come out uh, of the world of self -isola isolation and 1.5 meter distancing rules uh, d do you think most of us will come out of this well, certainly we'll come out changed in some way. Will we come out better people on the whole? Look, I hope so. If anything good comes out of this, I think that we know that the people who've been really important in helping us through this pandemic haven't been the hedge fund managers. They've been the nurses, mm. the retail staff, the cleaners. So maybe we start to really value people who really contribute in a meaningful way to society. But I think also we need to look at the gig economy because so many people had no safety net at all because they're in jobs without sick leave, without leave entitlement. So we need to look at, you know, the whole economy. But I think on a personal level, I think there's a whole lot of families realising that you don't have to be going out and buying things all the time and doing things all the time. There's an element of this that's been quite grounding, although, you know, I say that from a position, obviously, of, of privilege in that I'm not worried about, you know, covering next week's rent um, where so many people are. The other thing, Caroline, that I think we've uh, developed a, a deeper appreciation for, uh, aside from the frontline workers, is volunteers. And that we've seen some of the, be the worst the world can throw at us with coronavirus, some of the best too with what people are doing to help. 
Oh, my goodness. I've been so moved by some of the things that I've seen, particularly online, you know, the endless clapping and cheering and banging of pots for the for the health workers. And also, as Dee was saying, for the for the cleaning staff in the hospitals and other people that we tend not to appreciate or pay very well. But it is true that I think the world will change in ways that we can't necessarily predict. I mean, now that our um, employers, a lot of employers now know that their employees can work from home, will that become an option for more mm. people and for more women in particular who have been asking for more flexibility for a long time? I mean, how confident will you feel travelling overseas if you know the virus is still active and you might end up in a hospital mm. and how, how good is the care over there and will you have to be medevaced back? That kind of thing I think will play on our minds for a long time. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Dee. All right, have a great night. Yeah. Well, still to come, why now could be the perfect time for first home buyers. And giving thanks, saluting our frontline heroes. That's next here at the latest 7 News. The property market is in turmoil thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, but while it's bad news for sellers and investors, there are some winners right now. Network Finance Editor Gemma Acton joins us now to explain. Well, buyers won't be pounding the pavement on their property search this weekend, but thanks to virtual open homes and online auctions, sales are still possible for those in the market. As we know, housing affordability has sharply decreased in recent decades, but it could be set to improve as competition between buyers dwindles. Last week, consumer confidence bounced off record lows, but is still far below the long-term average. A temporary ban on arrivals into Australia, alongside rising job and income losses, will also weigh on buyer appetite, particularly that of investors, with the COVID-19 crisis making the market even less appealing, thanks to falling rents and the six-month moratorium on evictions. While sales are down, properties that are on the market are likely to be from highly motivated sellers. And when it comes to prices, experts say we could see a 5% drop if the jobless rate stays below 10%, but 20% or more if unemployment hits the teens. Interest rates are at rock bottom, with the cheapest fixed rates at 2.09% and variable as low as 239 Over the past year, demand for home loans from owner-occupiers has far outpaced demand from investors. The number of First home buyers hit a 10-year high in February, with the cohort snapping up over a third of all owner-occupier loans. For first-timers, government assistance is also available. Each state and territory has its own first home owner grant, and the first home loan deposit scheme helps eligible buyers onto the property ladder with only a 5% deposit. Well, thank you. Just doesn't seem to be a big enough phrase to express our gratitude to the men and women on the front line of this battle against the pandemic. Every day, these heroes go to work, risking their own lives to save others. So we've been having a look around at some of the ways that people have found to show their appreciation. Well, thank you. What are these for? These are for how you guys help everyone and the community. He's just 11 years old, but big-hearted Cruz Rapaya from Sydney bakes like a boss. I've just been giving cupcakes out to, like, police stations and hospitals because of how they're like really nice and they're just putting their lives on the front line. In the UK, a campaign to clap for our carers has gone viral. It began outside hospitals, spread into the streets, all the way to the palace. A COVID positive Prince Charles and Camilla and the royal grandkids joined the ovation. Outside a medical centre in Scotland and another in New York. Fire trucks burst into song. The Empire State Building has become an emergency beacon, while ancient pyramids are sharing a very modern message. And at Ground Zero in Wuhan, a skyscraper sized salute to the frontline heroes. In Louisiana, nurses from a cancer ward serenaded their workmates treating patients with coronavirus. While around the world, the blue of hospital scrubs colour iconic buildings, churches, city centres, even Niagara Falls. So many places and so many people wanting to say just one thing. Thank you.
beautiful to Isn't watch. Isn't gorgeous? Fantastic. They're yeah. doing such an amazing job. Your final frame is next on the latest from Seven News. Welcome back. Now, we are going to take you to Milan tonight and have a look at the beautiful Duomo Cathedral. It will remain empty this Easter except for a special performance by Andrea Bocelli on Sunday, which will be live streamed right around the globe. Isn't it beautiful? Let's take a look now at the temperatures around the country tomorrow. Canberra, possible showers in 16. Adelaide will see a few showers in the morning in 19 and a beautiful sunny day in Perth. In other parts of the country, Townsville will be mostly sunny, possible showers for Crookwell, Launceston, a few showers, a top of 17, and in the Alice, a sunny top, 30 degrees. And before we go, a really big shout out to the Good Friday Appeal team at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. The appeal has been running since 1931 and raised more than $360 million. Twelve months of community fundraising culminates in a 15-hour telethon on Good Friday. But things obviously a little different this year and fundraising has have to be shifted online. But despite everything that is happening in people's lives so far how's this 9.6 million dollars has been donated and our final frame tonight this gorgeous <laughs> little poppet six-year-old quinny she is the face of this year's appeal and isn't she beautiful so we send all of our love to the kids at the hospital to their families and of course the incredible and very caring staff Happy an amazing Easter, tally last year they raised 18 million dollars obviously things are very different this year so the premier daniel andrews has said that the government will make up the difference when amazing. it's all finished so but if you can help i know it's it really tough time but if you can you can head to donation.goodfridayappeal.com.au all those kids amazing really 9.6 million dollars has come in yeah. really considering what australians are up against absolutely yeah. so thank you for your company this evening from the team here at seven news that's the latest i'm melissa doyle and i'm matt doran good night